Warm greetings. The following tutorial will cover adrenal masses. It's not meant to be comprehensive, but we'll give you some highlights of some of the more common lesions that we encounter in the adrenal gland. The first one that I'll talk about will be a well circumscribed mass. Internally, whatever modality you look at it, it will be fluid density and uh, may have a few septations internally, very thin, and some of these septations may have some very thin calcification. So when you look at that, you're really going to be bringing up the diagnosis that this is uh, an adrenal cyst, but that's a descriptive term. Several different types of adrenal cysts that you can encounter. They're actually less commonly seen in the adrenal gland as, as opposed to other organs, but when you do see them, they could be uh, potentially endothelial cysts, such as a lymphangioma. Another possibility, though very rare, is that it's a true epithelial cyst of the adrenal gland. Often we see them as pseudocysts, or something that sort of develops in the context of, of prior insult to the adrenal gland, particularly in the setting of prior hemorrhage, with the clot you know, liquefied over time to create a cystic lesion. And really rarely you can see a parasitic cyst occur in the adrenal gland. I and mean, that really just depends on you know, where the patient has traveled or whether that uh, disease is endemic in, the lesion, in that region, such as echinococcus. On the other hand, a much more common lesion seen in the adrenal gland um, is the adrenal adenoma. They come in two different uh, varieties. Most commonly, they will be what we call lipid-rich. And those tend to be easier to diagnose based on imaging. On non-contrast CTs, they'll be homogeneous, and when you put a Hounsfield unit over it, it'll be less than 10 Hounsfield units. So when you see that, you can diagnose it as a lipid-rich adrenal adenoma. On MRI, you use in-phase and a post-phase imaging to detect some of the uh, characteristic findings of an adrenal adenoma. And what you're going to end up seeing is this rim of dark signal. It's often at the periphery of the mass where they're at the fat water interface. And that's going to be that India ink artifact that we see on out-of-phase imaging that will be absent on the in-phase imaging. So wherever water and fat uh, interfaces, there will be lots of signals. You have that black line in those regions. Less commonly, uh, you'll have lipid-poor adenomas, and they tend to be a little bit more challenging to diagnose. Your best bet is doing a washout calculation where you do three phases, an unenhanced phase, or non-contrast phase, an enhanced phase at about 70 seconds, and a more delayed phase at about 15 minutes. And you measure the Hounsfield units of the mass, and you can do a, a mathematical calculation, the enhanced phase minus delayed phase over the enhanced minus the unenhanced, or you can use online calculators to calculate this, inputting the data. And if you see greater than 60% washout, you're going to be confident that this is going to be a lipid-poor adenoma. Generally, they tend to be innocuous, but um, in the sense that they're non-functioning, they're not going to be malignant, but there are a subset that may end up being functioning, and when they are functioning, the most common syndrome that you end up seeing is primary hyperaldosteronism, also known as Con syndrome. So you're going to look at the sodium values, the potassium values in that instance to see um, if those are uh, affected. And less commonly, you can see Cushing syndrome associated with functioning adrenal adenomas. Next, we have uh, a relatively uncommon lesion that uh, arises from the adrenal medulla, as can be seen here. And this is going to be the pheochromocytoma. The characteristic imaging features that uh, we look for are on MR imaging, uh, light bulb bright T2 signal. That's not always seen, but uh, that has been the characteristic feature that has been described. But more often, we see a mass that's really hypervascular. Often, they'll have some degree of both, with the overall appearance tend to be somewhat heterogeneous. You do internal necrosis or hemorrhage. And on occasion, you can see a salt and pepper appearance you know, within the lesion itself. In those instances, the salt portion is just the hypervascular portion of the mass whereas the pepper is some of the flow voids that can be seen in these lesions. A couple of things to know about uh, pheochromocytomas. Epidemiologically, they follow this rule of 10 10% rule, or 10% are bilateral, 10% end up being malignant, uh, and the only way to diagnose that conflict on imaging is if you see METs, and so whenever you think about pheos, think about the 10% rule. And from a clinical perspective, not all of these will be functioning, but those that are functioning and uh, are symptomatic, those patients will present with these paroxysms of several symptoms, including headaches, palpitations, sweating. And so when you see that in a patient, you've got to think about a pheochromocytoma and see if some of the imaging features um, fit that, that potential diagnosis. 
Ultimately, you're going to need lab value to diagnose this. 24-hour urine metanephrines will be elevated in the instance of a pheochromocytoma. And then you may end up doing imaging either prior to or after a section of MIBG. It's useful, this nuclear medicine study, to look for METs preoperatively and potentially to look for recurrent disease in the postoperative period as we uh, monitor these patients. Next lesion is a rare lesion we see in the adrenal gland, but it's uh, reasonably easy to diagnose in that you see a mass and you see a blob of macroscopic fat within it. So when you see something like that, you're going to think about myelolipoma. Now again, these are uncommon tumors. On the imaging, you're really looking for an adrenal mass with macroscopic fat within it. The borders will be well defined, and on occasion you may see some punctate calcifications, but the, um, the presence of fat should really clue you into the, to that it's a myelolipoma. It's a mass made up with myeloid elements as well as lipominous elements. And when we find these lesions, they're almost always incidental. You don't really need to do much about them as they really have, are rarely symptomatic and uh, are almost always non-functioning. On the other end here, you can see a mass with uh, more ill-defined borders and um, quite large, larger than the other lesions that uh, I've drawn over here. Internally, this has a few calcifications that I'm drawing in here. So when you see this large, very somewhat heterogeneous mass with internal calcifications, you've got to be worried about an adrenal cortical carcinoma. When we say large, we're talking about masses that are typically more than 10 centimeters in size. Um, or at least more than five centimeters in size, but these really do grow large. Um, as I said, quite heterogeneous due to internal regions of necrosis and or hemorrhage. And you'll encounter these punctate calcification within it in about a third of these patients. This is one of the tumors that may invade the inferior vena cava, renal cell and HCC being other uh, tumors that can do this. So look at the vasculature to make sure there's no um, vascular invasion. And this is another one of the adrenal masses that may potentially be hormonally active. And in this instance, the most common syndrome associated with these hormonally active tumors are Cushing syndrome. And finally, I'll finish up with uh, a more a common and an uncommon adrenal entity. Mets are quite commonly seen in the adrenal gland. The primary tumors you need to look for are lung, uh, breast, renal, uh, potentially melanoma, but really anything can, can go to the adrenal gland as it's a relatively well vascularized organ. And really um, the clinical history is going to be key in these instances. You know, do you have a, a new mass in a patient with one of these primaries? PET-CT imaging is also going to be very useful in order to see if it's FTG avid. Finally, lymphoma, really, really uncommon in the adrenal gland, but I'll just mention here for completion when it's present, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is the more common entity seen involved in the adrenal gland and you know it can have a variety of appearances certainly can cause a rounded appearance of the adrenal gland or the adrenal gland may maintain its shape and be somewhat triangular in its appearance thank you for your attention